You don't need a calculator tonight, but welcome to our class. This is the Sustainable Plate 2003. It is a course at GW that's inaugural this semester. We're really excited about food here at GW. I am Kathleen Merrigan. I am the director of the GW Food Institute, which is hosting you tonight, along with the executive director of sustainability, and we have a thing called the GW Sustainability Collaborative, of which the GW Food Institute is a key part. Um, I wanna begin by thanking a couple of people, uh, Kyle McGowan and Ariel Kagan, who work with me and who work tirelessly to make this event happen. I wanna get that right off the top of my head before I forget. And also Daniel Serrano, who works for Chef Jose Andres, who's been critical in organizing tonight. You'll see here, um, we have a hashtag, GWPlate, if you want to join in the Twitterverse and talk about what's going on on stage. I um, said this is a class, so this is class number five. If you were with us last week in our smaller group, you would have been um, treated to one of our professors, Joe Glauber, who is a senior fellow at IFPRI, former chief economist. Yes, when you're supposed to stand up, Joe, I know you really love that, um, at USDA for many years. He talked about grains, and we also celebrated the International Year of the Pulse. We also have, thank you, Joe, we also have David Rain in the audience. He's over here with a lot of our students. David is a geographer. He's gonna be really helping us think through land and water, and um, a lot of his experiences in other countries, like Ghana, which he's entertained us with. Kim Robin is not here tonight, I don't believe. She's in the School of Public Health, and her area of expertise is public health nutrition. So our students are treated to a multidisciplinary team of faculty who also include Abby Wilkerson, who will be a moderator for our panel later this evening, and Chef Jose Andres. How's that? It's a pretty big team. Um, so my first duty here tonight is to introduce to you our university president. If you are from GW, he needs no uh, introduction. He is the 16th president of the George Washington University. He began in August of 2007. And when he came in, he said, sustainability is critical. It is now one of our nine core values. He and his wife, Diane Robinson Knapp, a woman who has chaired our Urban Food Task Force and has undergraduate master's degree in nutrition and was for 25 years a registered dietitian they bring incredible interest around food and healthy eating and a healthy campus and sustainability to, um, to GW. So uh, with that, I'll introduce the president, Steve Knapp. Uh, thanks very much, Kathleen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you. And I especially want to welcome the students who are actually here uh, to receive credit for being here tonight. If anybody else wants credit, who's not currently enrolled in the course and would, in exchange for just a small amount of tuition, we'd be happy to provide that for you <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of the evening. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the um, uh, newly chartered Food Institute, now formally chartered by the action of the faculty of the George Washington University. The Food Institute is led by Dr. Merrigan, whom you just met. It brings together faculty from a wide range of fields to study such topics as sustainable agriculture, the obesity epidemic, and the social impact of what we eat. Sustainability, as you just heard, is a core value of our university, and tonight's discussion focuses on the role of restaurants and sustainable eating. I'd like to recognize tonight's panelists, whom you'll be meeting shortly. They are Michael Babin, uh, chairman of the, of the Acadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, and the founder of the Neighborhood Restaurant Group. Chef Terry So, chef, of cu uh, chef de cuisine at Hank's Oyster Bar. David Hagedorn, food columnist for the Washington Post and creator of Chef's Best for Food and Friends and Chef's for Equality. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the professors of our course of which this event is a part. That's the course entitled The Sustainable Plate. And I'd like to introduce uh, next Chef Jose Andres, an author, educator, and the owner of Think Food Group. Chef Andres is best known to the Washington community as the owner and creator of a remarkable suite of innovative restaurants. Haleo, Oyamel Zaitinia, Mini Bar, Chino Chilcano, and right in the heart of our campus, his fast, casual, vegetable-centric invention, beefsteak. But he's also known both here and around the world as a passionate advocate for eradicating hunger, 
improving nutrition, and educating all of us about the pervasive importance of food in human history and culture. Chef Andres is the Chair Emeritus of DC Central Kitchen and the co-chair of LA Kitchen, organizations that combine job training with the promotion of healthy eating. When the terrible earthquake struck Haiti in 2010, he founded the World Central Kitchen, which focuses on issues of poverty and economic disparities around the world. Here at GW, I'm delighted to say that he serves as my special advisor on food issues and has been a valuable partner as well as an inspiration for our Urban Food Task Force, which as Dr. Merrigan mentioned, is chaired by Diane Robinson Knapp. We have also benefited, as we will again this evening, from his skills and insights as a powerful and eloquent teacher. Chef Andres was named Outstanding Chef by the James Beard Foundation in 2011, and in 2012 was featured on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people. In 2014, he gave the keynote address at our commencement ceremony at the base of the Washington Monument. On that occasion, in recognition of his many achievements and, uh, and contributions, we had the pleasure of conferring on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Public Service. And by the way, in his very, um, a rather extraordinary commencement address on that occasion, he uh, gave us a number of kernels of wisdom, and one piece of wisdom which I'm sure our students uh, will long remember and I think benefit from, and I've certainly uh, tried to follow it ever since that speech, was the following. If the recipe turns out other than the way you expected, change the name of the dish. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Jose Andres. Can I give him some hi. Hi, hi. Hey. Hola. Hey, we're standing, buddy. Ah. We're going to get it. I got my Fitbit on. I got to get my steps in. All right. So this is a class. And so um, like a lot of classes, we have a few PowerPoint slides, but we will not PowerPoint slide you to death. We have a total of 11, but it just helps tee us up. So Kyle, if you hit to the first slide. I'm interviewing Jose for the next half hour. That's right. I'm going to hit so my. I'm so my clueless. <laughs> I'm going to hit my, my little stopwatch. All right, so Jose, here is um, a slide. I'm co-chair of AGREE, which is an organization, a uh, consensus building organization, trying to get agreement on how to move food and ag forward. And one of my co-chairs, Emmy Simmons, is here. It's a bipartisan group. Deb Atwood is the executive director of that. We had out front a presidential call to action paper. If you didn't get it, you can get it on our website. We only had 50 copies. But the whole point of this, and this is not the only game in town, is we're trying to elevate food and agriculture as a national priority. And some of us are frustrated that we're not hearing enough of from our presidential candidates on this. By the way, it is the New Hampshire primary <laughs> night. Some people say, you've heard this expression before, Iowa picks corn, New Hampshire picks president. Big day for some of us. So the question is, Jose, um, what can we do about this? How can we get our presidential candidates thinking about food and agriculture beyond ethanol? Wow. Anybody from New Hampshire here? Did you vote? <laughs> Were you able to vote on Mel's? No? Ah, you already are good. We, we need more DC residents. <laughs> so I think the, the story here um, is this. If we think about asking any candidate for any seat, for Congress, Senate, for the White House, at the local level, and we go and we ask them, sir, what's your food policy, your food program, your food vision for America. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to freeze. They're going to tell you, oh, I love to eat in this barbecue place in my neighborhood. Thank you, sir. I expect better from you. And the simple reason will be this. If we think about uh, the restaurant industry, one every 10 working American works in the restaurant industry. Only for that simple thing, food should be an important matter, even a matter of national security. It's so important that even today we have retired generals, retired admirals, creating organizations to be loving Congress, to bring better quality food to the schools. Almost like happened 70, 80 years ago, that right after World War II, the school lunch program was created because also those same generals were visionaries enough to say we need to be feeding our children better. 70 years ago, because 
our children in America were underfed. 70 years later, because our children in America are badly fed. So only for that simple reason, of sure, every single candidate, that's a matter for what position, should be having kind of a food policy. We are at the very early stages, but you've seen that you are leading things like this, making sure that every single person that will dare to lead any American, at the local or the national level, should have a food policy because it's the only way forward. So tonight we're really focusing on the restaurant plate. Our overall class is the sustainable plate, but the question is, how do we make that plate sustainable? A lot of issues there. And Chef, if you could look at this line graph for a second. So this shows that people are spending more and more money at restaurants. This slide is based on U.S. Department of Commerce data. It shows that spending on dining is overtaking grocery store, store purposes, uh, purchases. Excuse me. So, wow. What does this tell us? What should we think about this? <laughs> it's so funny because uh, I had a board meeting today for my restaurants, and my longtime partner was uh, telling me, Jose, I am worried because it seems every day more and more people uh, are eating at home and not going out. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, five minutes before, I just received the slides from Kathleen, and I look so <laughs> smart. I'm like, well, my dear friend Roberto, let me tell you. <laughs> it is true that the perception will be like, we never had more farmer's markets. Who goes to the farmer's market here in Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C., I love you more. Washington, D.C. has one of the best nets of farmer's markets. So if it's more farmer's markets, you will guess that people are going there shopping, not tweeting that they are in the farmer's market, <laughs> and that means that we are cooking more at home. But at the same time, probably you've seen that the last year has been the best year ever for Washington, D.C. metropolitan area in number of restaurants open. So again, what we are seeing here is that I think, I do believe that over, these numbers are from 1992, the quality of the food that we cook at home somehow is really, is really increasing. At the same time, that what we see in number of restaurants is not so much the high-end restaurants. How many of you, you've been to minibar? because you'll go broke if you go. <laughs> but then places like Minibar are gonna be there, but they are a small niche. But what we are seeing is more fast casual, more fast food, good quality restaurants, what I call fast good restaurants, mm -hmm. that they are gonna be happening more and more, giving a lot of opportunities to small business owners to have the dream of owning their own business in the process of doing good, serving better quality food. So in one end, I love to see that finally, uh, as a restaurateur, that <laughs> people are eating <laughs> out more because this tells me I should keep investing, but that means it's also more competition. At the same time, we need to make sure that if people are there are gonna be enjoying what the food of Restaurants of America is, better prepared they are through knowing how to cook, it's gonna serve me better because they'll understand the difficulty that it is to be feeding America one restaurant at a time. When Yelpers complain about the restaurant not being up to standards, a lot of Yelpers here, I'm one of them too. I have a nickname. Uh, sometimes they're right, because we are not perfect. Uh, restaurants, they are only as good as the last plate uh, they did. But people being aware of how difficult it is to cook and feeding a family on a budget with good quality food only makes me, <laughs> gives me reassurance that when they come to the restaurant, everybody appreciates how hard work it is really to be feeding one person at a time. So, so Jose, I just switched the slide here. This is the same sort of information, a different view, bar graph showing restaurant industry sales. So the question is, you, you said that there's a trend toward this fast, uh, casual, healthy food, but in terms of overall people going out for their meals, do you think this trend's gonna continue or do you think it will plateau? I think this trend is still is gonna be increasing for the foreseen um, uh, future. I think I just told you that one every 10 American work in the restaurant industry. Um, the big challenge we're gonna be facing in the years to come is restaurants, we are operations that we base our success in feeding people. Are you with me? For a chef like me, it's very hard sometimes to think like I'm feeding people and across the street is people that are not fed. It's a challenge for anybody today. I do believe it's the 21st century way of thinking, but bear with me, let's see if I'm able uh, to get to this point. Wha one of the things really we're seeing with um, um, the restaurant, uh, 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 um, 
me uh, feeding people is that if we have restaurant industry, that because the minimum salary we are paying, and I'm including myself, those people working in the restaurants that you go to eat, when they leave the restaurant, they have to go for food stamps, what we call SNAPs, because they are not able to feed their families. One of the biggest challenges we're gonna be having is how the restaurant industry can be successful, can feed you in a, at the price range that you feel is logical, and in the process, we are able to make sure that everybody that feeds America is able to have the minimum wage that allows them to feed themselves and their families properly. This is the role of the restaurant industry, and this is gonna be a big task that we are gonna have to answer. I don't wanna be in the restaurant business knowing that in the process of feeding you, the people that work with me are hungry. <laughs> this, at, at some levels, is happening, and we need to change that dramatically, and the Farm Bill can one day change that on its own. Let's work on that. So, Sorry. Chef, uh, Dan Barber's book, The Third Plate, which is um, the core book for our course, and these are all of our students here in the front rows. Um, Hola, hello. <laughs> this is a passage from Dan's book, which everyone can read. The transcendental act of good cooking turns out to be more than just culinary. It's an ecological act, too. Um, <coughs> this is a class called The Sustainable Plate. Uh, chef, how... How much does a chef decide what to put on the menu? Huh. How much does sustainability play into your decisions as a chef? So how many of you have read the third plate? How many? Okay. <laughs> Plenty of cells for Dan. Dan is the nicest <laughs> guy, the most eloquent, the smartest guy I've ever seen. Much of his book was based, actually, I'm very happy, but Spain. I'm very chauvinistic, based on Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, he was studying the Iberico pigs. He was studying a foie gras. Hey, anybody from Peter here? a foie gras farm that <laughs> actually uh, feeds the, the ducks in a natural way, doesn't force feed them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a brilliant book. But here the question is gonna be this. Who loves sushi and who's been to a sushi restaurant in the last year? Ha, you sinners. <laughs> what are you doing here? Some of you even will talk how good tuna is and how good. And in another conversation, you will go to I don't know, somewhere to complain that somebody is uh, uh, mistreating animals, which you should, if they're mistreated. Tunas are disappearing. But we all keep supporting fish restaurant. I'm a sinner, I serve tuna too. I go to a vacation spot that is the biggest bluefin tuna town in the history of mankind. But this is the challenge we face in today's world. It's few cities around the world that they dedicate their lives for centuries in catching those tunas. And if you and I will agree that we should stop eating tuna because if not one day tuna is gonna go away and the entire ecosystem of the ocean is gonna go nuts. If we stop eating tuna, what's happening with all those hundreds of thousands of people that their lives for centuries has relied on the tunas? This is the amazing challenge we face feeding the world. But at the end, if we are smart, can be the amazing opportunities. What it is true is that when we preach, we need to preach as we behave. We cannot behave in one way and then preaching another. One thing has to go aligned with the other. I am eating less tuna? Yes, especially after I'm a scuba diver and I'm watching those amazing animals in the middle of the ocean going like crazy hunter. But we need to start living our lives as we preach. We cannot be preaching one way and then behaving different. So I'm not saying that now every fish restaurant and tuna and sushi restaurant needs to close, not at all. But we all need to start looking inside in order, in order to become an agent of change one by one. If not, we'll have no tuna and then we'll be the next species and the next species until we have no more species <laughs> left. So this is the food for thought. So you said a lot about the labor that goes into the plate. And we always talk about the three E's of sustainability, environment, economics, equity. Here's a picture of the 100th graduation of DC Central Kitchen. I know you're very close to that organization. Um, so there's um, a traumatic experience now in the food industry. People, as you're saying, not getting enough to eat and serving our food. But what are the opportunities? What are the opportunities for our economy if we do this right? Yeah. But very quickly, this is Central Kitchen. Uh, I've been with this organization almost 23 years. Robert Egger was the founder. He's in LA now. He opened LA Kitchen. Um, I've been uh, I've been at every level there. Uh, um, um, what this is Central Kitchen does, we take people out of the streets, we train them to be cooks, 
uh, uh, in the process we fight hunger, we create opportunity. We get leftover foods, uh, tomatoes that nobody wants because they are rotten, live it in a corner, but my mother goes and cleans that part. The other tomato is perfect to make tomato sauce. That's what this kitchen does in the process. Uh, I was on the 100th uh, graduation uh, and I never graduated from a school. So that day I began crying like a baby because they gave me my graduating diploma on that day. So I was very <laughs> pleased. The big opportunities, my God, there's so many, but just let's put a thought for a second. I think I just read in the news that California just released a whole bunch of inmates, thousands of people that you could argue that maybe they were not supposed to be in jail because maybe their sentence was too harsh. And so in one hand, every inmate in California can cost between 70 and 80,000 per inmate to the state of California to keep them in jail. So we give them as we should, breakfast, lunch, dinner, we should. They are inmates, but we should be treat them with respect. On the other hand, we have a hard time feeding our children breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So big opportunities in this crazy politics of feeding American food in the world is, wouldn't be smarter to start feeding every single children that born in America, period, without hesitation. So we are setting them in the right path for a better future instead of, at the end, investing money into the problem, instead of investing money into the solution, and at the end having to be feeding the inmates, that happens, and many of them, some of them, and being an inmate because they didn't got the same opportunity you and I have. This will be some of the amazing challenges, but opportunities we will face. We'll need a strong Congress one day to be bold enough to start investing into these solutions instead, inst uh, instead of keep throwing money at the problem. Okay, that's that's, that's what you should be doing. There. All right. Are yeah. you agreeing with this? <laughs> So. <laughs> You're so silent. <laughs> You're I understand my <laughs> accent, but come on. <laughs> You're all going to have opportunity to ask questions. So, Chef, I want to, the National Restaurant Association does this yearly list of what the key trends are. This year, well, 2015, environmental sustainability, hyper local, house made, farm branded, and artisanal items, pickling and fermenting ethnic and fusion cuisines and gourmet kids' menus. So what do you think of these trends? I'm particularly interested in what you think about kids' menus, as I'm a mom. And do you think people eat differently in restaurants than at home? OK. I have a big fight with everybody in my company because I have no kids' menu, ever. The only places I have is in two hotels I am, and because I cannot fight the big hotel. My restaurant, zero kids menu. Why? Because kids should be eating what their parents eat. Just think about it. If you give the opportunity to my kids, they will only eat the crappy uh, macaroni and cheese, I don't want to even pronounce, <laughs> and the crappy chicken tenders that the only chicken they saw was a photo one day in the factory when they put them. <laughs> so my, as a father, I've always tried to do in my restaurants as I do at my home. Not like I'm the preacher, but at the very least, this is free America. You don't come into the restaurant if you don't want to. So I've been very successful on that. And many, many parents over the years, they've always congratulated me for not having the kids' menu and not putting them <laughs> against their children. On mm. I want to order from the kids' menu. Uh, but you're talking trends, trends, trends. Who, who believes in local? Who? who? Uh, you are a whole bunch of sinners again. <laughs> you, you are a danger to national security. <laughs> Only think for a second. We're talking about, uh, some people call them illegal immigrants, other people call them undocumented. I like to call them people. Um, if we are investing in avocados from the beautiful region of Michoacan in the heart of Mexico, and we buy avocados through the year, not only in Super Bowl day, and we are giving a reason to those families to do a sustainable business around avocado and tourism and other things. Do you think anybody from Pascuero, which is actually beautiful, will want to leave home to come for a better world? No. So the answer to local, yes, but only to a degree. But don't give me a speech about local, please, when your genes come from Cambodia. Again, we need to be pragmatic in the way we see things. But what I can tell you that the biggest trend is that we all need to start being logical about everything we think about food and not be radical in the process of not knowing. We need to start thinking the connections that food has in ways that we don't even perceive. 
but what I know is that I'm consuming avocados from Mexico. I know I am investing in the betterment of people there, and so one day is no reason for them to leave their home. So we will never have an issue with undocumented people or crossing. When people want to leave their homes, it's because they are in a very bad shape. And it's up to everybody to making sure that we invest in those communities that they are not doing as good as we are, so they don't have a reason to leave home, including our own neighborhood. So this will be the biggest trend, to make sure that we understand that everything needs to be pragmatic and more logical. Local is great, but we cannot be radical local. If we become radical local, I don't think it's the world you would want to be part of. We need to be pragmatic local. And to me, drinking tequila, I know. I'm supporting a local economy. <laughs> Welcome, Margarita, people. There you go. So, Chef, um, one of the uh, articles that the students read for today's class talked about chefs in portion sizes. And it said that many chefs perceived that they were serving regular portions when, in fact, they went well beyond the recommendations for size in the dietary guidelines for Americans. So that prompted my, in my head a question, what are you thinking about portion sizes? Do you think about the dietary guidelines for Americans? <laughs> um, you know, what about that whole thing about putting the plate in front of the person, what they expect and what you, what you want them to expect? So, <laughs> two things. <laughs> When I came to America, roughly, first I came on the Navy uh, of Spain as I was a sailor. But then when I came to work with a legal visa, in case anybody from immigration is here, um, <laughs> I began doing tapas. Everybody knows tapas? Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that while I was not by no means or Haleo, the first ones bringing tapas, yes, we were. Washington, D.C. and Haleo was the city that we began believing in a smaller portion. So, you know how many people has complained in my life about how small my portions are? <laughs> Do you know how good it makes me feel that now everybody says that we need to be eating <laughs> smaller? <laughs> Obviously, people will say, Jose, you were a visionary. No, I did the only thing I knew how to do, which was a small portion. Uh, even my body doesn't equal the small portions I sell. <laughs> so people eat in my restaurants to point eight tapas per person, um, and this is great. But what one thing really we need to do at the top level, at the USDA level, which you know a little bit, uh, one thing or two about it, is that everybody knows the food pyramid, and now everybody knows the my plate, we my call plate. it now, yep. the my plate. And if you take a look at the my plate, the percentage of fruits and vegetables, half a plate, is like half a plate, half a half plate, 50%. Plus grains is another one, a tiny one, right? Plus we have the grains and beans, which has its own side, then leave it fish, then leave it meat, and the fat, and thin even fat is moved out, its own thing. If 50% of my plate, which is a simple, iconic uh, photo that is done by a government agency, says that Americans should be eating 50% of vegetables and fruits, why? our farm bill supports such a little percentage of those same fresh fruits and vegetables that actually my plate is telling us. So if we will only, in the next 10, 20 years, make sure that our farm bill supports that iconic image, I do believe America has a huge future ahead. Simple, equal the farm bill funds, to that iconic my plate. Until that doesn't happen, we're gonna still in a very big hole. And they say when you're in a hole, stop digging. Right now, we keep digging because we are not putting the right funds in what we are supposed to. So here at GW, as you know, our students, we expect them to be citizen leaders. That's what George Washington said in the, you know, when he wanted a university in this great city. Citizen leaders, so this is the challenge to them, right? Not just you and I, they need to help change that farm bill. When kind of, yes. Yes, that, that was a simple answer. Yes, <laughs> and we only need you to become something like this. The majority leader, <laughs> the president, <laughs> or all of you combined, you be at once at Congress, or even better, at the Senate. I do believe this can be achieved. When we began uh, here at George Washington with support of Mr. and Mrs. Knapp, 
all the food initiatives, the human task force, the class I began doing that <laughs> you came to send me after and we keep doing this, uh, you keep doing this class talking about food issue. It's only the true understanding that more education, more knowledge about how amazing the food world is because it's no other thing in life that can connect with so many things at once. Food is national security, food is health, food is history, food is science, food is uh, uh, public policy, F food is everything. Food is everything. So by giving um, uh, uh, the true importance to the meaning of food in our lives, I do believe one day, starting at the hill, we can start affecting not only the way America is, but how America will run in the future and so many other countries around the world. That's why keep bringing forward the importance of food issues and finding the connection between everything is gonna be very powerful. We cannot be solving this problem by concentrating one thing at a time. We need to start seeing the connections between the many food issues. Every single food issue has many ramifications and we need always to be very aware of the importance. Every decision we, we make may solve one problem, but may create others. So we need to be highly aware of all the connections that we have uh, after we make any food choice or any food decision. So um, here's my question now. You got restaurants all over the world. I'm very willing to go visit them anytime you need a scout. Um, but what do you think makes the DC restaurant scene special? How is it changing? What do you think, uh, what do you expect to see more of or less of in the coming years? I well, just put the president there because he's my guy. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, you know. he's a powerful <laughs> figure. Yes, he is. Uh, Chipotle, that's right. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I love Chipotle. I have a card, I have a card <laughs> that I have Chipotle free for life. And actually, and actually everything has happened with Chipotle will be very easy to finger point at them. But Steve Fells, the founder, let me tell you, I will clap at him and what he has done because him single-handed has mm -hmm. shown us that it's a better way to be feeding America. So yes, he's going through some issues, but those issues I don't think alone they are of Chipotle. They're part of the food community we created. So I give him a big round of applause because I do believe even going through these hardship moments that can happen to anybody, I do believe he still is a visionary and he still will be a leader in how we're gonna keep feeding America. And I know it's bold to say that in the moment we see with Chipotle, but I do believe he's brilliant and he will solve the issues he's facing and we'll see a Chipotle that will keep showing us the way to people like me and many others. So that's uh, food for thought. DC food scene, what's special about it? I, I see hope because when I see a woman of New Hampshire <laughs> becoming a DC resident, <laughs> I'm being, I hope, proud of it. The worst thing that has happened in DC that always they speak so badly about Washington because the hill, I live now in, uh, where do I live? Bethesda. In Bethesda. <laughs> <laughs> it's like changed a few times. Thank you. I live in Bethesda now, but I'm a Washingtonian at heart. Uh, I do believe this city for, we are 600,000, 660, not much many more. Um, today has one of the most unique group of young chefs, small entrepreneurs, showing Washington DC and America the way, different ethnic restaurants in what is more important. When I came to Washington, I was 23. My first guest was Patrick Moynihan. And in Haleo, believe me, was nobody on a Sunday night. Nobody. So I know that Haleo was very important next to the Shakespeare Theater to bring value to a neighborhood where nobody will walk. Now I see the restaurants opening in different neighborhoods in our city are the way forward because a restaurant is almost like this beautiful place that brings everybody together one community at a time. So it's many young chefs, too many to be mentioning, that are making this city without a doubt, to me, one of the most exciting cities in America. And I don't know you, but I've eaten in many cities. So if I have a proof here visible to all of you that I do it, I think by my work, I've eaten in many cities. And this city to me is without a doubt, at the expensive level and at the more affordable level, one of the most exciting cities to eat anywhere in America. So I was a little nervous. You, you're not clapping for that uh, statement? <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to rest. Now I like it. <laughs> so hey. I was all nervous because I, I didn't have your restaurant up of that last slide. But here it is. <laughs> yeah. All about beef steak. So you rec yeah. recently opened this uh, fast, casual, veggie-centric veggie restaurant on campus. Yeah. President Knapp discussed it. 
Um, what made you want to do that? Why veggies? I know the half a plate. Anything else you want us to know about that? To you be guys come, come, to, come. To be or not to be, as you see. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to do a fast food restaurant because I'm tired. Everybody else used to making those concepts that then they are worth so much money. And <laughs> if I can come up with one restaurant, why can't I come up with one that can be thousands? But the truth is that was many things. One year after Mrs. Obama arrived to the White House, she gathered over 1,000 chefs in the lawn. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people criticized her for what the heck is she doing? Me, I be, believe me when I tell you that was a very bold statement. Uh, I don't know if at that point they knew what they were doing, but they were, what they were doing was challenging every single chef and food person in America to be part of the conversation in how come we feed America better. The Let's Move campaign was created and in that moment, I'm not going to lie to you if I don't tell you that inside myself, I said, OK, we can all go and keep talking. And we all clap like seals. Because usually, the same people gather, and we all agree. And we talk about what we agree, and we clap. And then we leave. <laughs> oh, man, that was so cool, the talk. But then we don't do really anything. So this was a challenge of mine of saying, can I make people eat vegetables in a fast food environment? And my wife very much was the one that made it happen. Because what you don't do with them, what you do with us. And what we do is we boil the vegetables at home, olive oil, vinegar, and we I love them. We create beefsteak for that reason. Because my association with George Washington, this was the right location to do it. And I feel like a home here. Second one is going to be UPenn uh, in a university environment. I'm opening nine more in this coming year. So I can tell you, if we succeed, we're going to do it very well and fairly quick. If we fail, I love it because it's going to be so crushed that the tomato never saw a bigger crash in its history when you <laughs> throw it against the wall. But what I know is that what I learned in America, if you want things to happen, you need to be bold. You need to dream big. And then you need to put all the resources and knowledge you have to make it happen. I could do the same with pork because I have the best pork in the world. Pam, 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 look at that, pam. I have <laughs> one of the best porks in the world. <laughs> Iberico, which I control the import. I could be doing the pork concept of America tomorrow. No local use comes from local Spain. But I thought, let me be bold. Let me do the bigger challenge. Let's bring a bowl of vegetables to every American. And let's start having a true change in the way we feed America, giving one vegetable at a time the opportunity to feed America use one bowl at a time. And that's what I did. I'll be successful? I don't know. But if I am successful, I'm going to tell you. George Washington had a lot to do with the success of this state. So wait and see. We'll see what happens. Chef, wow. I'm going to have you sit there. And I'm going to ask my panel to come out. I hope they know they're in the queue. Our moderator is Professor Abby <coughs> Wilkerson, who's in our university writing program. And one of the things I saw Abby do last year, we had a great book reading. You're switching off the water. That's a good idea. Uh, we had a great book reading, and all of our students, our freshmen, incoming freshmen, uh, read The Good Food Revolution by Will Allen. And Abby had a series of environmental justice lectures over the course of the year, environmental food justice. So I thought she'd be the perfect person to moderate our panel. And let me see if they're coming. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think they are at beef steak. That, that was a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Are we okay so far? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. So, carry us, uh, Michael. We're putting you in the order that you're up there. Okay, I exit stage. <laughs> you're in Abby's good hands. And you? I'll come back up at the end. All right. I really want to thank Kathleen for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here joining the Sustainable Plate class and on the stage with these incredible innovators um, in our local food scene and beyond, obviously. Um, all right, so my first question is for all of you. Um, I was just wondering if you could just briefly, to get us situated, tell us a little bit about what led you into the world of sustainable food and just briefly how that translates into what you're doing day to day now. Um, I guess I'll start, <laughs> ladies first. Uh, um, I think um, it really kind of started actually before I came here and I was in Arizona and uh, I was out in the middle of nowhere in a desert and 
<clears throat> kind of was like, you could eat Nepalese, you could do a couple other things, but there were some local farms around. So really it was a bunch of, um, I, I headed out to try to open it, to help open this restaurant. And all they wanted to send me was uh, large corporations like Cisco and things like that. And I went out to really search further and to try to find local, um, to find local bakeries, to find people who could sustain basically an economy that was much smaller. Um, so that's how I got started. And then in all reality, though, now that I'm at Hank's Oyster Bar, oysters are probably one of the, if not the most sustainable seafood out there right now, especially in this area. So it, it's really uh, come kind of like tenfold with that. Well, I, before I was a writer, I was in the restaurant business. I became a, I went to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, but then I became a line cook, much to the right, <laughs> delight of my family, <laughs> and uh, at the Tabard Inn, and this was in the 80s, and it was a time where uh, a lot of people like me were going from college into kitchens, and they were very intellectual environments. They were incubators, and we competed with each other. We did a lot of research, um, and we and by research I mean books. They they're these uh, <laughs> bound things that have <laughs> pages in between them. We didn't have uh, phones to look things up on, and um, so when I, we were always interested in new ingredients and new things. And this is the era of Jean-Louis Paladin, who really showed chefs in Washington and in the country a new way of thinking about food and of using local products. And Nora Prion after him was promoting this, Jose, other chefs. And we <coughs> were always very supportive of each other and traded information. We, we weren't proprietary about it. We, we always wanted to do better. And that's what we did. So David is a writer, but he's a heck of an amazing chef. So you should be too. He is. Is. If you want to have a friend, he should be <laughs> on the person you look. Well, um, I was pursuing a much more uh, typical Washington career. I'd worked on Capitol Hill for a little while. I was uh, working as a lobbyist. I was in Georgetown Law School at night. So my parents were extremely excited when I told them that I was going to open a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> Although at the time, the first restaurant was 18 years ago, and I thought, I really thought it was just a, a sideline. You know, I thought it was a fun project. I was going to open a business in my neighborhood. I was going to have a bar that I could walk home from, which was going to be really convenient for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was just a, it was sort of a one-shot thing. Um, uh, you know, three years later, I had really fallen hard for it. Um, and it's an easy business to fall for. There's some amazing people, you meet people with tremendous passion, um, and it's got an energy to it that is hard to beat. Uh, uh, but in, in those days, uh, trying to buy local, it was really hard. Um, just making a commitment to fresh food every day was, was, was hard. You know, it wasn't the way that the system was set up, uh, and that started to sort of radicalize me, I think, a little bit. And then uh, years later, um, we really started, the restaurant group, had always had a, um, a big civic commitment to the communities that we operate in. And we pursued that in a lot of different ways. And we also tried to source really carefully and, and, and responsibly. Um, and eventually we decided that we would take whatever firepower we could muster on the civic engagement side and really put it into, uh, into the food, into the food uh, arena. And we started a nonprofit uh, call, called Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture. So the, those, the, the, the food justice world, the, the, the sustainable food world, and, and my work life are totally, um, you know, integrated now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to a specific question for each of the panelists. So I'm going to start with one um, for, for you, Terry. Um, you had um, mentioned the role of um, farmed oysters uh, at your oyster bar. Uh, and I think it's really interesting how we've sort of taken on this idea that um, wild um, seafood must be inherently better. Um, and in fact, in terms of the course text, um, the students in the class, I believe, have read where Daniel Barber writes in the third place, though chefs serve farm-raised fish all the time, they're cheaper, they're abundant, and they're consistent. I didn't know of any well-respected chefs promoting farm-raised fish. 
farmed fish have an unsavory reputation among chefs for the same reason most musicians don't talk up the wonders of computer-generated sound effects. We prefer the real thing. So maybe you could talk to us about what kind of risks there might be in overvaluing wildness. What happens if we consider the case of farm-raised oysters? And what can they show us about the role of, aqu of aquaculture in the sustainable plate? Um, I mean, that's absolutely pertinent, um, especially with us. I mean, we do occasionally get in wild, but uh, for the most part, uh, most of society has always loved oysters. And so uh, the decline of oysters over the last 150 or 200 years has gone to 80, 85% which is, I mean, the love of it is great and all, um, but oyster farming is essentially just another method utilizing uh, the same environment habitat, and you're, um, you're actually preserving a lot of that habitat, the natural resources, you're not dredging into uh, the environment down below, and um, we're primarily eating about 95% of aquaculture or, for, or farmed oysters as you would want to call it. Um, they're, they're in the same environment, so they're getting this, a lot of the same uh, water column nutrients, and uh, you get a lot of the same for, uh, profiles. So really, in all, all in all, we're actually helping the environment in that case. Um, I mean, I think it gets a bad rap because you hear the word farm, and you're thinking, oh, I must be getting additives, or I must be getting uh, some kind of preservative in there or something like that, but all, it really is just, you know, a few cages, a little tumbling. Um, they use natural tile systems in some areas there too, so you can get a lot of different, uh, I think, pros for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. If I if I could add to that, <coughs> this uh, farming has gotten a bum rap, and I think maybe one of the reasons why that happened is because. In the beginning, there were a lot of unscrupulous people who right. were doing it, had yeah. some really bad practices, and so there was a boom, and then there was a crash. And now, like anything else, it has to, you have good actors coming into the market who are doing good things and, and making a commitment. There's a shrimp, a gulf shrimp in Texas from, from Papano Bay that's a farm-raised shrimp, and it is it uses the water from the bay, but it regenerates it completely. So there's no there's no use of water. There's no waste of water, and the amount of food that it takes to to feed these shrimp are certainly a lot less than you know beef or pork or anything else. And it's a it's a terrific product that you can trust. So there are you know I think we're making a lot of headway in this in this uh, in this area and. Certainly, there's <laughs> wild fish that, uh, you know, have some major problems. Yeah. Yeah. A, yeah. An important number is that 2016 was the first time ever that the, that the output of fish coming from the ocean that was farm raised was bigger than the wild mm -hmm. output. Mm -hmm. But said that, shellfish is perfect uh, to show how we can harvest and farm the seas, the ocean, mm -hmm. but the hard truth is that a wild tuna, a wild fish, without a doubt, will always be better than farm. That's the hard reality. Uh, the issue will be that we are not gonna be able to do this to the nine billion people uh, just taking every single white fish out of the ocean. And that's the hard reality that we are all gonna have to be asking, and so what's next? Mm -hmm. I do believe that a lot of uh, uh, improvement are, uh, is being done in how we can uh, maximize the potential of the ocean to keep somehow producing what will be the new semi-wild fish, fish that uh, still kind of will, like the oysters, be feeding out of the nutrients, having the farms in the right currents, and somehow controlling the output through those uh, farms in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And one day, I don't know if it's gonna be 10, 20, or 50 years from now, I know that uh, the entire world is gonna have to unite to really control every single fish that comes out. Because at the level, we all know that at the level we keep fishing, uh, the oceans are not gonna be able to keep up. So that's gonna be the challenge. Flavor-wise, unfortunately, until today, 
an oyster, yes, but it's still not a farm fish that can equal the flavor of a live fish. It's still to this day mm. has <laughs> not happened. And l at least that's my opinion. Mm. Is it your turn? Mm -mm. Um, well, my next question is for you, David. Um, you wrote in a 2013 column in the Washington Post, chefs are always looking for an ingredient that will become the next big thing that dieters will revere and their peers will emulate. Even the side dish section of the menu is part of a trending phenomenon. If you don't think so, I have seven words for you. Maple glaze of Brussels sprouts with applewood bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and you then went on to predict the rage for cauliflower as well. So um, it would be great to hear what you think the implications are of this perpetual quest for the next big thing in terms of the sustainable plate. Are there ways that that quest can enhance the mission? And does it pose any challenges? And I can't resist asking, was it an accident that you focus on vegetable-based side dishes? Um, hmm. it, it, it wasn't an accident because I, 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 review, I also review restaurants, so I spend a great deal of time in them, so it's uh, easy for me to identify trends. Uh, um, and my sunchokes are the new cauliflower, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> They seem to be on every menu. And um, uh, I, I just am wor working on a piece on Chefs of the Shenandoah, and I think every restaurant I went to between Front Royal and Stanton had sunchokes. Let me on tell the menu. you, they are hard to cut. So you yeah. better, it's <laughs> worth it to eat them, but it is very, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I did identify the cauliflower. The, the, the reason, the main thing that drove me was ennui. I love Brussels sprouts, and it got to the point where I could not eat one more Brussels sprout because <laughs> they were ubiquitous. And the cauliflower thing has taken off, and now uh, the price of cauliflower has soared. Mm -hmm. This is where the uh, this is where the implications of sustainability come in because I I suspect the chefs, you know, from my experience, we do want the new th the next new thing. Sometimes it happens by coincidence. And uh, another factor is fashion. Fashion, fashion and food changes like fashion and clothes changes. So people want Brussels sprouts. So that's driving the market. People want the cauliflower. That's driving the market. So the law of supply and demand kicks in. It's pr it's really pretty simple. But we the chefs certainly have the power to channel that effort into something that really needs to be supported and. Uh, like the blue catfish is a good example that we have um, fish that's doing harm and what's the, you know it's what are you going to do you figure out a way to to sell it and get other chefs to do that and make it a popular thing so uh, i guess i guess i'm saying that it's not necessary sustainability is not necessarily what drives people in the creative process but it can be it certainly can be part of that and they certainly can be influenced to think more about it and make better choices in that regard. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that that I think um, you know one of the salient characteristics of the food system that we have is, is monoculture, you know, that um, only a few varieties of, of this historically very rich abundance of different types of vegetables are really grown in any quantity now. So I think uh, this trend of, of chefs searching out. Everybody wants to have something unique um, on, the, um, on the menu, something that nobody else has, and call it out, call it the farm it came from, or the farmer, you know, they pull it out of the, the, the rooftop farm on, on, your, uh, on top of the building. And, uh, but there is, a, there is a purpose to that, I think, which is just exposure uh, to the general public so that, you know, if we eat these things, if we care for them, if we want them, then the market will eventually respond and we'll start to break out a little bit of this, this uh, the, the, bi the bounds of this, uh, the monoculture that you know, characterizes the system. Yeah. Any other comments on the quest for the next big ingredient? I mean, uh, it's, it's really hard because everybody's, you know, you almost want to not eat out at certain restaurants because you don't want to get so influenced by other right. people all the time. So that's a really big thing. For me, I mean, I try to eat out, and I get yelled at for not eating out, and then I get yelled at for it, you know, <laughs> like, it's just like this I big. 
yeah, it's just the ba back and forth. And so you're just trying to think outside the box, but really do keep to the risk of um, my farmers. And sometimes even before the season starts, they, they ask me like, what do you want to plant? You know, or what do you want us to plant? And so we do affect a lot of what's going on there too. Um, mm -hmm. And when I asked them, I was like, I know that, you know, strawberries are going to be in season, but can you, before they even ripe, can you give me a couple of green strawberries? Um, or just things that I, I want that other people aren't, might not have on the menu. Um, and I try not to focus on what everybody else is doing or what I'm doing. Um, so that it, it gets to, it gets to be hard to see what's kind of actually trending. And then you're like, well, that's a good trend, but I'm going to go in this direction because this is what I feel right now. So you kind of have mm -hmm. to trust your gut, I think, for the most part. Uh, I think we're going to have to divide between necessary trends that will be good mm -hmm. for all of us mm -hmm. and fashion trends. Who, mm -hmm. who likes quinoa? Come on, who ate quinoa in the last year? <laughs> you sinners again. <laughs> <laughs> you read what happened when Bring the quinoa on. began being exported, <laughs> imported mm -hmm. into Europe and the States, that the price of quinoa in the countries of or enough quinoa, where actually the local indigenous population was relying on the quinoa crop. For them, chicken became cheaper than the quinoa itself that they were re relying. So this was kind of a, a issue of national security in many, in many areas mm -hmm. uh, down in South America. Uh, but then I will tell you, move away from those trends when they happen, because in the process of you thinking you're doing good, because somebody's telling you, you're helping the indigenous people of the middle of Peru. In the process, probably, we are doing harm. On the other hand, lionfish, uh, uh, as I told you, 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 you know, I love scuba diving, and I just find out that now I can fish for fish and be good. Lionfish are killing every single reef and coral ecosystem because they are no, they don't belong to the Caribbean, they came from Asia, and now they are kind of destroying uh, uh, every single population of any fish because they don't have enemies, so now it's, like in Cayman Islands, for example, a whole bunch of divers that they unite and they go many times a year hunting for the lionfish. That's a very smart trend. You should start eating lionfish because in the process, you are gonna be, fi you're gonna be supporting the, the Caribbean future by eating one lionfish at least once a year. So those are the, the, the trends that somehow are, you know, is, is the cool thing to do now. Mm -hmm. And then the other trends that you, you should get really on because you can do a lot of good by by being part of the trend. Mm -hmm. and Sometimes those are also contradictory <laughs> trends like uh, heritage pigs, you know, the, the pigs that are the most popular are the ones with the most fat. And we talk about uh, diet, a good diet is part of, a healthful diet is part of sustaining, an important part of sustainability, and yet what's there, there are evil fats, like uh, fast food things are evil, but fried chicken is proliferating all over town now. <laughs> you know, fried chicken's right okay, and right. so is the fattiest pork that you, we can get our hands on. Mm -hmm. It's also the most delicious pork. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's, there, in your quest for sustainability, I mean, you, you often think you're doing the right thing, you're alf often sometimes not. So there are definitely contradictions all along the way. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, my next question is for you, actually, Michael. Um, so you wear a lot of hats in the sustainable food movement, both as a restaurateur and in the nonprofit world with the Arcadia Center. And um, the mission of the Arcadia Center the center is dedicated to making positive change to the food system in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding region. So um, could you speak about how your food justice work informs your work as a restaurateur and vice versa? And what do restaurants bring to creating more just and sustainable food systems? Well, I mean, I, as I said before, I think that it's a, our, the work on Arcadia is really an extension of 